The information presented is for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are not necessarily the opinions of any Daikin company. This information should not be confused for accounting, legal, medical, or other professional advice. Please seek advice from a qualified professional for any specific questions. Welcome to the Accelerated HVAC Success Program. My name is Ben Middleton. I'm the National Sales Training Manager for the Goodman, Amana, and Dykin Brands. Today, we're joined here with Danielle Putnam. She is the president of the new flat rate. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. Ben, thanks for having me. I am really excited to be here. Well, this is exciting. And the first question I love to ask everybody, how in the world did you find yourself in HVAC? Because that's not where you first went, is it? I knew you were going to ask, and I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. And then right now I'm really into Alex Ramosi and he's like, riches and niches, riches and niches. <laughs> I was like, you know, HVAC is a niche. I might stay here. But to be honest, you know, I was born and bred. My dad, my grandfather, my brothers, my uncles, they're all contractors. So I, I was around it my whole life. And what I love, Ben, why I've stayed is I love being involved in the entire circle, if I could say that the entire life cycle mm -hmm. of a business and HVAC provides that it, allow, it allows you to do marketing. If you want to do marketing, to do sales, to work with your hands, to fix things, you can do so many things in this niche. And that's why I've stayed. But you did escape from the HVAC industry for a little bit, didn't you? <laughs> I did. And I came back. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go? I grew up in Georgia uh -huh. and then I went to Texas for, uh, let's say, after high school, I went to Bible school for four years, and it was a missions organization. So we went all over the mm -hmm. world taking teenagers on mission trips, which is totally crazy. Uh, but because I had worked in my dad's HVAC business growing up, you know, as in answering the phones, running parts, and things like that through high school, I had a resume. Everybody else at this organization did not yet have a resume. Mm -hmm. And so I got to move up to the upstairs offices right away working in marketing and really began to love marketing. So that was in Texas. And then my dad calls, you know, and he's like, hey, I could use some help in my HVAC business again. So after that, I went back to Dalton, Georgia, stayed there for a year. And then I was like, ah, I just haven't scratched all my itches yet. I've still got to do some more exploring. And uh, I ended up in California for five and a half years working for digital um, software. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it was a public company. We started in 2005. I know this is a long answer. No, uh, this is good. We went public in 2007. But what I love about that is everything that I was able to experience in that process of business. And so after that, so five and a half years, um, when my dad and I were best friends, we always have been. And as a contractor, he had ideas to try to solve the pains that he mm -hmm. was experiencing in his business. And he's like, you know, I've got this new idea for this new pricing system. I said, yeah, that's a good idea. You should do that. <laughs> he's like, well, I can't. I, I can't do it without you. And I understand now. You know, as a contractor, so many times we're owner operators, we're mm -hmm. in the field, we're putting out fires, we're really uh, trying to grow our business and struggling, it's difficult, we're being pulled in so many directions. And so to have a new idea that you know will help yourself and others, sometimes we need a team and somebody to come alongside us to launch it. And so in 2011, he's like, hey, if you move back home to Georgia, I'll give you half of the company, we'll start this new company together. I was like... I would like that. <laughs> so tell me a little bit. You guys started the new flat rate. We did. What is the new flat rate? It's always new. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Every day it's new. You know, he keeps asking. My dad does Rodney. He's like, should we rebrand and come up with a new name? I was like, no, it's still new every day. <laughs> but the new flat rate is a menu pricing system. And so historically in the trades, we've had time and material, mm -hmm. flat rate pricing, and then the new flat rate is five different price points for anything diagnosed in the home, repair or replacement. And so it's an automatic sales presentation tool to help take that pressure off the technicians to sell and to try to increase their average service ticket. Mm. Let's come up with an automated system that does it for them. And that's the new flat rate. So pricing is a, is a big hot topic right now. There's been all kinds of things happening in the economy, happening mm -hmm. uh, with pricing, with inflation yeah. right now. Uh, you've got consumer uh, debt levels at all-time highs, and uh, of course, we're in an election year as well. Yeah, and so you got all kinds of different things going on. How have you seen pricing 
change uh, with contractors? I mean, some people use a multiplier, some people use mm -hmm. a divisor, some people use some sort of a, a net profit per hour or net profit per day. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see pricing evolving or changing? Hmm. You know, we had a contractor tell us the other day, I doubled my prices and nobody noticed. I was like, what? <laughs> and now they were using a menu and so there mm -hmm. was different options, of course. But then we have so many others that say, hey, I haven't increased prices. I haven't changed prices at all. And they might be scared to do so. And so we've definitely seen, you know, both ends of mm -hmm. the spectrum. Um, but what I love about the menu and options is options provide solutions, lots of solutions mm -hmm. and creativity for homeowners. And so we've seen more and more contractors uh, being creative with what they're offering, repair, replacement. And then also, if I can do a little plug in here, we just partnered and did a full integration with Optimus Contractor mm -hmm. Financing. And that has really helped provide more opportunities and solutions for contractors. I'm so excited because now in the menu automatically with the click of a button, they can see their five different options and the payment plan terms and everything that they could do financing wise. And then they can click there to get financed right away. So that's been super exciting. We've got a very high adoption rate. Contractors are running to it and saying, you know, with full uh, energy, they're very, very excited about it that, hey, I'm going to make so much more money this year because of this. So I think some of them have been a little, you know, nervous because of the economy and people. But at the same time, um, they have to push forward. They're diversifying. They're looking at, hey, I have skilled uh, workforce. I have a skilled workforce. Mm -hmm. I have a team of people. What else can we do? What can we offer? They're spending time in training, making sure that their technicians feel very confident to know what to offer in the home and to present. I think it's really important right now to be very close to the business life cycle in a service business and the, the value we're adding to our customer. So with pricing, it's not about, well, it is about price until you make it about something else. And so we really want to make sure that we're providing good value in the home so it's worth the price because people are looking, hey, should I fix this or fix that? I can only do one. There's, there's a lot going on for sure. Um, but I heard this economist last week at the CEO. It was a CEO strategy summit. He was a global economist. And he's like, um, in an election year, he's like, it honestly doesn't matter. And he's showing all these trends. And economists aren't always right. I get right. it. He's showing all these trends. He's like, you know, we still have a strong economy. And so let's look at, let's be smart, let's be wise, but even though it's an election year, what comes is going to come. Let's still look at serving our customers to the very best we can. And I related with that very strongly. It's let's just continue to grow and move forward and provide great value. I think you said a lot to unpack That there. was a long answer. <laughs> it usually is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just to kind of backtrack and, and look at some of the things that you, you said there. So I think one of the things I honed into was you talked about, you know, it's about the value that you bring. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, so important. You know, when I talk to so many contractors, one of the fears around pricing that I hear from so many is I don't want to rip my customer off. Mm -hmm. I hear that a lot. Yeah. And I think that's where there's a hesitancy. Should I raise my prices? I don't want to charge too much. Mm -hmm. And I think we both have done the exercise a million times where you say, okay, here's your cost of equipment. Here's your, here's your cost of labor. Go ahead and tell me what the sell price should be. And if you have 20 people in the room, you get 20 different prices. Yeah. But I, I, I think the big thing is, are you delivering what you said you were going to deliver? Mm -hmm. Did you give the experience that, uh, you would be proud of? Is that the type of experience that you would want to be recorded and to be on, you know, the 10 o'clock news right. and, and somebody watching, or is that not the experience that you can be proud of? And, and, and did you cut corners because maybe you didn't charge enough? Mm -hmm. And so there's all of these things that start to go, go back and forth there, but you look at supply and demand. One of the big things I've heard from for probably the last 20 plus years is you can't find enough good help to come into the trades. I mean, how many conferences have you and I both been at yeah. where there's somebody talking about what do you do to fix your labor challenges Every that time. you have? So if we've got short supply mm -hmm. of all of this valuable labor to be able to provide great services, people shouldn't be afraid of charging what they need to charge to deliver an unbelievable experience every single time. I fully agree. And 
how often do we not charge what we're worth because we don't believe we're best in class? Mm -hmm. And maybe as a service company, we're not best in class. But let's accept that and admit it and look at what are we today and how can we incrementally improve. And you can improve by calling your customer back, by, you know, simple things. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a whole rebrand. You can do simple mm -hmm. things. It can be, hey, if I promise to give an estimate, I'm going to do that. Because so many of our, of our competitors and peers are not doing some of the little right. things, right? And so accepting, all right, what's the state of my business today? Am I valuable? Well, yes, I am. I have a business. I have some workforce. I have tools. I have skills. I know how to do what the customer does not know how to do, and they need me. And Ben, that's why options is so important, because we cannot prejudge what the customer mm. wants to spend, what their budget is. We don't know. And when we provide value, we provide options, we let them choose, they can based on their budget. And that, uh, well, it gives us the opportunity to have a high option that's more expensive and a low 99 cent hamburger, right? right. And it's, it's actually Burger King that came out with a 99 cent hamburger. Some people think it was McDonald's, but random fact. <laughs> that, that burger, though, gets us in the door. It's like, hey, you know what? I can afford it. I'm going to call, you know, this HVAC company because I know that I can afford them, but they're going to give me options because maybe today I can spend a little bit more than I usually do, right? Yeah, it reminds me, one of our more successful contractors that we have out in the Pacific Northwest area, uh, they have billboards all over the place. Yeah. And the billboards all say, brand new air conditioner, $99 a month. And they, that most of their advertising budget goes into this billboard campaign, and they just keep this going all the time. And I asked the question one time, well, how many $99 per month air conditioners do you sell? And they said, you know what? It's funny. Not a whole lot of $99 yeah. a month. We sell a lot of $129, <laughs> a lot of yeah. $139, a lot of $159, even some $199. But totally. uh, to your point, that yeah. $99 a month gets them in the door. Mm -hmm. And now they That's can right. have a conversation. and. Give the customer options. Here's, here's all of the different options, yep. and the consumer will pick what's best for them. Nobody really wants the $99 a month plan. Right. And nobody really wants it, but they are nervous about what they don't know, right? And they want you to go and provide the solutions and show, hey, you know what? I can fix this for you and take that pressure off of them. I can fix it, and here's how much it's going to cost. Once they know that, okay, good. There's a relief. I can do that. So you've been around the trades a long, long time. I, I have to ask the question, how many of the people in your family that ran all of these home services businesses really enjoyed sitting behind the desk and doing price sheets and uh, putting all of that stuff together? Yeah, good, good, quite. Nobody's <laughs> asked that. <laughs> My youngest brother is 21. He's a welder. <laughs> he, he left the industry, went to another one, but he was, uh, let's see, when we started the new flat rate, he would have been what, 10. And he was the one running the laminating machine, all of the flat rate mm -hmm. price sheets. And so he was the one that was helping us build the books back in the early, early days. And so, yeah, no, none of them like to sit behind a desk and work on their, on their price books. <laughs> so, and the reason I bring that up is I look at some of the more sophisticated industries that are out there. Uh, I always like to look at the airline industry. So you yeah. get on in flight and you look at all of the people sitting on that plane with you. It, you can be pretty safe to assume that not many people paid the same amount for a seat to get from point A to point B because the airlines change yeah. their prices on a daily basis. And yes. they're looking at supply and demand. How many seats do we have? How many people are looking at these? You know, how many routes do we have? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on in, in this particular area? And they're maximizing their profitability for every single seat on that airplane. Yeah. If you started to think about, uh, or even hotels, you know, a lot of people travel, stay in hotels. Mm -hmm. Not every hotel, even though it's the same room, same view. Yep. They all different prices depending on the season and the time. Yeah. And, and, and I will you know, never demand. forget. It was probably 15 years ago and I was flying home for Christmas and I bought my ticket at the last minute. Mm -hmm. So as a college kid, I'm sitting there and I look at the person next to me and I said, how much did you pay for your seat? And it was probably like 250 bucks. I was like, I paid 800 for mine. <laughs> <laughs> I totally asked. <laughs> so, so we think about that, but imagine if our industry, if we were able to get to a point where it was easy to mm. be able to flip a switch and say, hey, look, we're booked out for the next two months. Yeah. I don't have any more capacity. And to use for the throttle, the actual pricing that we have, mm -hmm. 
yeah, we'll, we'll get somebody out there, but it's going to cost, you know, $800 yes. for this seat instead of $200 for this seat. Yep. Don't we like to make decisions based on our convenience level, mm -hmm. right? As a society, we already are going there. So we are going to do that. Mm -hmm. That is where the future is going. You're right. You know, I read a book a long time ago, Push the Limits by Bill Gates, and they were moving their company from Texas to where maybe Palo Alto and he got two speeding tickets on the way up there. They're moving over the weekend. He's like, we don't got time to go slow. We got to push the limits. We got to break things. You know, and the same same here in this scenario is that I can imagine that future that you're painting because I know that that's where we're going. And we do have contractors that have had a lot of success with saying, hey, our after hours emergency rate is, you know, triple. It's X, Y, Z. And consumers do pay for it all the time. I mean, especially like a Sunday afternoon if right. it's cold, right? You're going to pay based on your convenience level and, and what you can afford. And so, yeah, I could totally see. I know that the technology that's changing everywhere is completely infiltrated in our pricing world as well. And so all of that's going to begin to be more and more automated. We should expect that and embrace it. It's and, exciting. And so, I mean, a company like the new flat rate, it's pretty easy to take a look at the pricing mm -hmm. and change it mm -hmm. um, with just a couple of clicks. Yes. <laughs> just a click. So easy. You know, that, that's right. We've done a lot of the hard, well, all the hard work for our members. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful that we can do that for them because I know that it can be a headache. And uh, so, yes, you can just click and change your prices or do the different things. But, uh, you know, I was doing some research about, you know, everybody's talking about AI and um, we use that. But so many other people use the LLM. Well, it's mm -hmm. just large language, you know, module. It's mm -hmm. just this big database of data, 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 I say both. So I've been thinking about that a lot lately in pricing and with the new flat rate of, you know, we all have this, this data and contractors all have this data too. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the patterns of what do your customers pay after hours or when you're slammed or different seasons. You have that information. Sometimes we forget to look at all the data that we already have that could really help. It's just predictive. That can help us predict, hey, what should we be charging for this next season? I think sometimes we forget the data that we have, the power that we already have. Well, and you know, it's the, it's the simple economics when you take a look at supply versus demand, right? And if your pricing is too low and your value is too high, you end up burning your people out. Your people yeah. are, are the ones that uh, take the brunt of it. Yep. Now, as a business, we brought in more revenue. But you could also, instead of killing your people, you could double the price mm -hmm. and have them work a, a normal amount of hours and still yeah. realize those revenue gains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and pass a lot of that to your people too, right? Yeah. What's it's that do for culture? Complete. It's so not worth it. And you know, we'd like to think, oh, we're making more money, but no, we're not. <laughs> Especially when we start looking at the churn right? and how hard it is for us to find and retain our next technician, our next superstar, because we burn out the old one. Uh, we cannot, there's the price tag on that. It's way too great. And so we, we can't afford to do that and to burn out our team. So we love to train and to coach, hey, let's run three calls a day, mm -hmm. right? Let's maximize the opportunity in the home every time. And that way we really can have a great work culture and people can love what they do. And if we have to say no to some customers, we have to say no. But don't worry, there's another business next door. I mean, they can call somebody else. Well, and think or about this. They might wait for you. Yeah. The customer, mm -hmm. if that tech only has knows that they only have to see three calls that day, they're not feeling rushed. Right. They can spend time with the customer. Yes. And now all of the things that we talk about, you know, check the battery and the smoke alarm for them. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and help them change that light bulb that's hard to reach because you've got your stuff in the house Absolutely. already. Those little, tiny, small yeah. little things, those go a long way. Yeah. And we're, not, we're not rushed. And then all of a sudden... Uh, so much liability goes down too. You know, we're mm -hmm. not we're not getting injured. We're not making stupid mistakes because we're rushed. We're not forgetting to bill or charge or file or you know, there's so many things right. that uh, just manual error that happens when we're rushing as humans. And so, yeah, completely. Let's slow down. So one of the things I've heard in our industry for a long time is that uh, maintenance should be a loss leader. What do you think about that whole entire concept? It's old. <laughs> I think it's old because I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Just because contractors are finding great success with, hey, we're out here on your maintenance call, but let me go ahead and show you a menu. This is what we're going to take care of. But would you like to do some other things while we're here? And then all of a sudden they are making so much money 
on those maintenance calls, mm -hmm. whether it's just an upgrade on the service today or it's something re being replaced. And so we're moving more materials, more parts, more boxes, and we're maximizing the opportunity in the home. So it could be that $99 billboard, right? That's getting us in the home. I'll take that. But a loss leader, I don't know that we can afford that. Uh, it's interesting. I had a contractor do an experiment. Mm -hmm. So they put an ad out and they did $39 tune-ups. They knew they were losing money on every single tune-up. Okay. And they saw this is how many leads came in and yeah. we went out and did those leads. Then the next month they changed it to $129 tune-ups. Guess what? They got the same amount of leads. And then he said, well, let's just go and, and see what happens. I think I actually need to charge to do the tune-up that I want to do. I need to charge $289 per tune-up. And he put uh -huh. that ad out, $289. The lead volume did not change. No. <laughs> and so it's so funny when we talk about pricing. I think it, you said yeah. it, and I've said it many times, yeah. our industry almost has this self-esteem crisis. Right. We don't feel we're worth it. Yeah. We don't feel that we should be able to ask for that much mm -hmm. money. But when you actually just put it out there yep. and you get it in front of people, nobody knows what they should be paying. Yeah, yeah. But they also know what it's worth to them, right? right? I mean, I will never forget it. My husband and I had an Airbnb in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. It was a Friday night at 6 o'clock, and we were in Atlanta at a Braves game on a date. Friday night, Braves game, Atlanta, a long way away from Chattanooga. And so the tenant, the Airbnb renter calls and, hey, you know, the air conditioner broke. Well, our system was every bit of 18 years old. Hmm. Air conditioners broke. We got a tenant in there. So Josh calls his local HVAC company and in our heads already, minimum $500, easy. It was like 235 I mean, I <laughs> wanted to go over and visit that owner crying for him and say, you are dying and you don't know it. My point is there is a perceived value and cost in the homeowner. And as contractors, we're, we're stepping on ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we need to find out what is, like you said, they're raising the rates of their maintenance or their specials and seeing that the customer's still paying, like we're putting our own glass ceiling on ourselves. John Maxwell always says, raise the lid. Like we're doing it to ourselves. And I'm not judging. I do it. We all do it mm -hmm. in some form in our business, in our life, right? And so let's recognize that and start working on lifting that lid. And how could our company actually grow and move to the next level and be fun again? That's what I'd love to see. Contractors yeah. just say, this is fun again. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any last words of wisdom that you want to share with all of the HVC contractors out there? I love 2024 already. Love, love, love it. And I want to push the limits in everything I do this year. And I really just want to encourage everybody to in our industry, like do it with me. Let's do it together. Let's push the, the limits with the value that we provide, the new technologies that we provide, the barriers that we're busting, the glass ceilings we're breaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really big year, and I, I hope we all do it together. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. Hold on. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. And for all of you that are out there, if you liked this episode, please make sure you hit the like button so we can do more episodes like this. And make sure that you go ahead and follow us so you can be aware of all of the upcoming episodes we have.